Bibles, please, and open to the book of Galatians, chapter 5. Yes, we're still in Galatians. Yes, we're still in chapter 5. We're just getting started and having fun, right? Sometimes contrasts aren't exactly welcome. If someone says to you, I like you, but, right? I like you, but, you're probably not going to like the next few words that come out of their mouth. The Urban Dictionary calls this but phrase something a person close to you says to point out a flaw, a mistake, or to just be mean, but to do it in a nice way. You're this, but. Now, I guess it all depends on what you start with, right? Because if somebody's first words are nice, and then they say, but, duck, because something opposite of nice is heading your way. But if their words start off with something bad, and they say, but, you're in for a blessing. Now, in Galatians 5.19, we saw this last week, where Paul said, the works of the flesh are evident, which are these. And we had that terrible list of despicable, disgusting, detestable, yucky stuff. And those were the things that we ended with last week, remember? So the but, so the but of verse 22 is a beautiful but. It's a beautiful contrast. The works of the flesh are all these terrible things, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. I've been waiting for a whole week to hear that. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another or envying one another. Let's pray and we'll dig in. Thank you, Father, for the chance to take your word again. And thank you for this beautiful contrast. We thank you for this uh, a spiritual fruit bowl that we're, we're about to look at. And they're very familiar verses. But, oh, Father, in our familiarity, may we not have contempt. In our familiarity, may we not think that we, we've learned everything there is to learn. But rather, Father, help us, to, help us to see the things you have for us. Perhaps new things, perhaps deeper things, perhaps a new perspective because we're reading it and we're studying it in a dis- different season in our lives. And things are different as we get older and as things happen to us. I pray, Father, your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. And I want you to see here, that first of all, that we live... We live by what God has provided. It's very important because there are things in our lives that that are true positionally, but must be claimed in practice in order to enjoy them right now. Last week we talked about things that are now but not yet. And so they're here but not fully here. And today I would say we have things that are done but are still being done. Done but are still doing. Because there are things that we have that God has promised us, that Christ has guaranteed us, that the Scripture is clearly giving to us, and yet we struggle with some of the things in the here and now. I have an example for you, as you might imagine, Second Peter 1 3. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this because we came to know Him. If you're a child of God, you have every single thing you need to be holy. So how many people, don't raise your hands, still struggle with holiness? Are you perfectly holy because God's given you everything? No, positionally, we have everything we need to be righteous. In God's eyes, we are saints, which means what? Holy ones? But there are a lot of Christians who don't act saintly. That's because though we have it, We are not always enjoying it. We have it positionally, but in practice, we're still still working on it. So it's done and it's needing doing. So we need to receive what we've already been given. We need to receive what we've already received. Look at Ephesians 1.3 on the same page here, right? For another example, he says here, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And so if we already have every spiritual blessing in Christ, why does God tell us to pray without ceasing? Why pray for something you already have? Because what we have is positionally all these things. And God has made us rich kids, spiritually rich, but we can, we can live like paupers. God has given us His peace. My peace I give unto you. Let not the world uh, t- take that away from you. It's come from me, I give it to you. And yet we, we let everything in life disturb us. Our challenge then is to do what we see here, to receive what we've already received, to enjoy what is ours in our account already. We live by what God has already provided. To enjoy the inheritance that God has given to us, we need to do certain things. Now, there's a third example of this positional, practical thing. 
right in front of us. Because positionally, the flesh has already been defeated. The old man, our sin nature, is down for the count. And Jesus is Lord. That happened on Calvary. It was applied to us when we were converted. Now, Paul's been beating this drum for quite a while. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, you remember, where he said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We see it there in 2.20. We'll see it again in 6.14. Let's take a little preview of coming attractions. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom what? The world has been already crucified to me, and I have been crucified to the world. Nothing can alter the fact that we are overcomers right now. Positionally, the old man, it shouldn't be an issue. Positionally, we're seated in the heavenlies, but we're walking in the earthlies. And we have, though we're not in the flesh, the flesh principle is still in us. We saw that last week. And so in practice, even though positionally the flesh has been defeated, in practice the flesh still needs to be defeated. Day in and day out. Temptation by temptation. You know, I often remind you to check the tense, right? I say, look at, look at the tense of the verb. Uh, but grammar fails us in verse 24. Because in verse 24 of Galatians 5, Look at it again. It looks like it's in the past tense, right? And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Have crucified sounds like past tense, teacher Doug. But actually, in the original language, this is an active verb. It's an active voice verb. And so it speaks to us of something that has been done definitively on the cross, but needs to be done conditionally in our lives. We need to recognize that what God has done for us is past tense. We are crucified. The world has been crucified to us. It's an already done thing, but it still needs to be done in an ongoing manner. And though the tense doesn't show it in our English translations, any of them that I could find, the idea here is that it's something that has been done and is being done as we walk in the Spirit and are able to, in our practice, respond and allow that which is true positionally to be true practically so that we're able to enjoy on earth what we already have in heaven. Does that make sense? We have been crucified. Now stop living like, stop living like you got grave clothes on. We have been set free. Stop acting like a slave. We are rich in Jesus. Stop acting like a poor kid because we need to recognize what we have already received and live in light of that. What I'm talking about here is partnering with the Holy Spirit, cooperating with the Comforter to make heavenly realities our earthly experience. And so we need to recognize that God has done this for us on the cross, but the enjoyment of His victory is conditioned on our response every time the old nature rises, raises His ugly head. And it is ugly, as we saw in verses 19-20. And 21. So we need to walk by the Spirit, verse 16, crucify the flesh, verse 24, abstain from fleshly lusts, as we see here in the end of the chapter, and then in 1 Peter 2.11, Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Now think about that. You know that verse. You've seen that before. If we have victory already, if the bad guy has won, then why do we have this battle? Because that positional and practical thing. We, here's the encouragement, by the way. I'm just thinking about this. If the ultimate battle has already been won, don't you think we can, we can handle the, the little battles that come to us today? If the worst thing that can happen to us can no longer happen to us, if death is defeated by Jesus, then every other temptation is less than that, and we are able to say, no, sin does not need to win in our daily lives. We can say, no to our desires. Now, I want you to hold your place here, please, and turn to Romans chapter 6, which is uh, maybe the definitive passage that shows us this, gives us both sides, the, the positional and the practical. And it's very important, because otherwise, we could be very discouraged. We could say, well, I shouldn't be sinning because I'm forgiven and I'm a child of God. And yet, we're still tempted. Have I lost something? Have I not done it right? Did I pray, did I pray the wrong way? Did I lose one of the four spiritual laws? No, it's because of what's true positionally. It's always true, cannot be changed, will not be changed, but in our daily living, 
We need to, by God's grace and His power, live according to what He has already given to us. Romans 6, verses 6 to 14. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to all, to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present the members of your body as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to Him. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but you are under grace. This sounds very definitive, does it not? You shall not sin. You do not need to sin. You are not under the law. You are freed from that. You have been given everlasting life. You have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. You are able to, to be, we are who He says we are, and we have the ability and the privilege to know that, and that should be the end of the matter, right? Well, it isn't, because we still sin. Remember we looked at this in verses 18 to 23, where, where Paul talks about the fact that, that he wishes he could be, could be done with this life, that he still sins, the things that he wants to do, he doesn't do, the things that he doesn't want to do, he keeps on doing. Remember that whole struggle? Why is there a struggle when you read these verses? Here's the key, verse 11. Look at it again. Verse 11, Romans 6. Likewise, you also, you see the next word, reckon. Reckon yourselves to be what? Something you already are. We are dead to sin. So reckon yourself. Live that way in your lives. Let your practice line up with your position. Recognize that God gives you the ability to do this. He has provided for you all things that pertain to life and godliness. He says you can overcome. He says you do not have to sin, right? Recognize, reckon, apply your deadness to sin and your aliveness to God. And do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Don't obey it in its lust. For sin, verse 14, shall not have dominion over you. No more, no how, no way, because you are a child of God. So bring your practice by His help into line with your position. So he sees both of us, both of them are given there. And so as a result, that God has given us what we already need, that we live by his provision, the result now is that we can bear what God produces. And this is a very important part that I want to get to then, the, the fruit bowl, the, the fruit of the Spirit. And there's been a lot of, how many sermons how many people have heard at least 20 sermons on this text in their life, right? At least, remember, admit it. I'm, I'm probably too low, right? I mean, this is one of past, pastors love to go to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. They don't do the stuff before. They don't do the stuff after because that gets kind of challenging. I'm just being honest with you. Um, we love Philippians, pastors do, and we don't like Hebrews. It's a harder book to exegete. exegete. But we have this wonderful text that we've heard so many times before, but we still get it wrong. And here's what I want you to see is that God produces spiritual fruit in our lives. Would you say that with me? God produces spiritual fruit in our lives. There is no command anywhere in Scripture that says, produce the fruit of the Spirit in your life. You won't find it. I don't check any translation you want. It's not there. There is no command that says, bear spiritual fruit, because that's something that happens automatically. He produces the fruit, and our job is to bear what he's producing. We get all confused as to, as to what we're supposed to do, and I want to clear that up some today, if God would give me grace and the words to do that. So let's look at this wonderful fruit of the Spirit, right? Love involves serving a person for their intrinsic value, not for what they bring to you. Agape love never abuses somebody else. Agape love never fears or seeks to protect itself at all costs. God's love is, makes us secure. Joy, love and joy is a delight in God for the sheer beauty of who He is. It has nothing to do with circumstances. It's the opposite of hopelessness and despair. If you're a child of God and the Spirit is in you and you're walking by that Spirit, you will, you will overflow with love. And you won't have done it on your own. 
and you will be so joyful, and it won't be because you won some great, I almost said the lottery, but we probably don't play that here. It won't be because you got a whole gob of money in the mail that somebody else who played the lottery and it fell out of his car by your house. I don't know. It, it won't be because of that. You'll be joyful no matter what. You'll be joyful no matter what the doctor says. Oh, sure, you're praying for this. I don't mean we have to say, yippee, yippee, I'm so glad that I've got a problem. But there's a deep contentment. You say, God, if this is what you want, I want it too. Don't spare me anything that you endured for me. That's the joy that comes from the Spirit. Peace, a confidence, and rest in the control and wisdom of God. Would you have any anxiety if you really had peace? Of course not. He says, be anxious for nothing. And you say, how can I do that? You can't. Unless the Spirit of God is doing that. When the Spirit is filling you, when the Spirit is controlling you, when you're walking by the Spirit and abiding in Christ, who has time for worry? Because He gives us a peace that the world didn't give and the world can't take away. Long-suffering is the next part. The ability to face trouble without blowing up or striking out at others. It's a patience that keeps us from resentment toward God or others. Kindness. The ability to serve others in practical ways because we're secure in Christ. I like to say that kindness and goodness is, is love in action. And goodness is the next one here. Being the same person in every situation. A good person is not a phony, is not a hypocrite. And you're able to live for others. Jesus, others, yourself, J-O-Y, as we used to say. And then faithfulness or faith. This involves loyalty and courage. It's being a person of our word. It's being reliable. Can I count on you? Yes, you can, because the Holy Spirit of God in me is bringing that as part of the fruit in my life. And then gentleness, humility, uh, an ability to turn the attention away from our needs and our wants and always focus it on others. And then self-control. Uh, the ability to focus on real issues rather than urgent ones. The opposite of being impulsive and driven by desire. Isn't that a, a much better list than last time? Aren't you glad you came back? I know you were saying, I'm, 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 I need the second part. I need the second list. So we gave it. The other shoe has dropped and it's a gorgeous shoe. Am I right? So instead of the works of the flesh, which is a cesspool, we have the fruit of the Spirit, which is a fruit bowl of the most pungent, delicious, amazing fruit that you could ever see. But, but we're not done there because there are some principles here that we need to understand. Why did, why did Paul start talking about fruit? I mean, is he a horticulturalist? I mean, is he, somebody that, is he a, a vine dresser? Why would he bring up fruit? Because there are things about fruit that we need to recognize and that help us. Fruit is inevitable. Where there is life, there is growth. And one of the things that proves our salvation is that there's growth that there's fruit. And so if you're a child of God, growth is inevitable, or what? You're not a child of God. How fast you go, you know, the, the measure, the, the, the amount, that's different for each of us. But if Christ has saved you, it wasn't just a transaction where he said, okay, you were unsaved, bang, now you're saved. It's not just a transaction, it's a what? A transformation. He starts working on you from the inside out. And so fruit is inevitable. Read this with me, please, from Matthew 7, 15. Jesus was speaking, right? Ready? Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. And so there is a sense that fruit is inevitable. Where there's life, there will be growth, and here that growth is fruit. The next thing I want you to see here is that fruit is interconnected. None of the nine parts of the spirit, of the spiritual fruit, function apart from the others. Here's, it's very important to get this. Did you notice in your text that it calls a spiritual fruit singular and not plural? Did you think maybe the translator lost an S? I mean, this is what God wants us to see. The spiritual fruit is not spiritual fruits. It's a singular thing. It is spiritual fruit. And I believe that a growing believer will show evidence of all the fruit in their lives. It's not like this section is working on being loving today. So you're the loving, you know, that's how I'll be loving. And you're the joyful ones. You work, don't worry about love, that's their thing. You be joyful, okay? Peace, I want some peace. And you guys be long suffering. It's not that way at all. If you are a child of God, if you are filled with the Spirit, if you're walking in the Spirit, you will have an increasing amount of love, joy, peace, 
long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meek and self-control. Those things happen, what? Automatically. Because that's part of who the Spirit is. He doesn't give you one ninth of himself or two ninths. And so for us to have this sense that somehow we need to work really hard on these things takes away the whole idea. I mean, those are works. Do you notice the contrast? The flesh has works. The Spirit has fruit. How hard do you think fruit works to pop out on a, on a, on a branch? Do you, do you see the sweating apples, you know? Stressful pears, you know, just trying, I, I need to be born, I need to burst out. No, of course not. The, the life comes from below, from the roots, from the vines. It, it's not the fruit at all. Trees don't give, I mean, apples don't give life to trees. Trees give life to apples and so on. And so we have to understand that this is a singular thing. They are connected. The next thing we need to see, I think, is that fruit can be impeded. It can be hindered. Did you wonder why back in Galatians he says things down here like uh, verse 26, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. I believe those are some of the sins that are very common that keep us from showing the fruit. Because the Spirit lives in us already. We saw that last week. We have the Spirit. We're baptized in the Spirit. We're sealed by the Spirit. We're indwelt by the Spirit already. But if we quench the Spirit, if we stifle Him to our sin, then the, the natural and supernatural fruit will not come out. And that's why First Thessalonians 5.19 says very simply, do not quench the Spirit. See, you, you have to have the Spirit or you couldn't quench Him anyway. And we quench Him, we stifle Him when we sin. So I need you to turn a couple pages over again. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, 25 to 32. Ephesians 4, 25 to 32. Therefore, he begins in verse 25, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but only what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Here we go. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. Please, do not make a list of things to do this week. Uh, these, are my, these are my to-do lists. Every, every message, or rather every meeting I go to in our church, and I go to a lot, I told my secretary many years ago, and they all follow through, at the end of the packet of information, I have Doug's dues. There's always something that I have to do. I'm responsible for. Please do not put this on your list. Oh man, this week I got to stop being bitter, and wrath, and anger, because the key is verse 30. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. If you are not grieving the Holy Spirit, if you are not quenching the Holy Spirit, then the rest of the stuff becomes possible. Because it's not about us, it's about Him. Again, He produces these virtues in our lives. And our job is. Well, what is our job? What's the command in, in Galatians 5? In Galatians, it's walk in the Spirit. We're going, to get to, we're going to get to John in a moment. You're ahead of me. In Galatians 5, it says walk by the Spirit. If you walk by the Spirit, then these things will come. And so it's not walk by the Spirit and then work on love, work on joy, be peaceful, be long-suffering. Not in this text. There are places where it says love one another. I get that. But in this text, he tells us how we do it. Walk by the Spirit. If you're going to take something home, that's the command. Lord, help me today to walk by your Spirit. Help me today to be so close to Jesus that His Spirit fills me and takes control of me, and these things will be, will be in my life in continuing and increasing percentages. And so we see that fruit is inevitable if you're saved. Fruit is interconnected. Fruit can be impeded, and fruit comes from the inside. It has spiritual roots. Fruit doesn't make the tree. As I said, the tree makes the fruit. And I have two branches up here. It's not too often that I get all illustrative. 
Um, but um, there's a lot of dead trees by my house. And so I found some branches across the street. We live by the forest. So, I mean, these are dead. These are dead dead. Even I can break one of these, okay? So this is a branch. And as you know, there's no life in this branch. That's why, I think that's why we call it dead. But if I was to tie some apples to the tree, would you say, look at the life in that branch. What a lovely living... It's got fruit on it. Look at that. The, the beautiful, aren't they beautiful apples? Anybody tempted? Anybody want to have lunch time? No, you would say, look, that's, that's phony. It's dead. Putting something living on top of a dead thing doesn't make that thing alive. And the Bible says that you and I, before we come to Christ, are dead. And so then we do a lot of good works. Oh, I'll go to church. That's a great looking apple. I'm going to do some good works. I'm going to give money to charity. That's a, that's a double apple. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And people around us and say, oh, he must be saved. He's doing some good stuff. You can't make death into life by doing stuff. The whole idea here is that we need the Holy Spirit. But once that is cut off from the vine, or in this case from the tree, there is no life. I don't care what you do to it, it's not going to be living. And a lot of people that I know are doing good works to try to get saved, and it doesn't work for them. It doesn't work for any of us. The connection, my friends, even as Christians, we, instead of trusting in the Spirit, we, we know we're saved, but because someone told us we need to have fruit in our lives, we work really hard to go to Bible school. And we're, we're first in our class. We're a student all the time. And we do Christian service assignments. And we say no to ourselves when we go on the mission field. And we do a lot of things, sometimes in our own power. I was raised very performance-based. Bless their hearts, all the people that love me and all the people that love Jesus. Maybe I just didn't hear them right, but I came out thinking that the fruit in my life was the evidence of my ministry. That it was my giftedness, or, or it was my ministry, or the size of the church, or how well I did teaching the kids in Awana. And somehow it became about me. But the Bible never, the Bible never equates fruit with superficial external behavior or results. In fact, look around you, look in society, look at some of these guys on TV who have really big churches, and then listen to them for a while. Do you think numbers makes them acceptable? they got a bigger church than us. They must be spiritual. That's not the kind of fruit God's talking about. I don't think it's performance-based at all. I don't believe that that's what God wants. If we weren't saved by that, we've talked about this before. And so you and I can be doing things in our own power, and we're alive in Christ. We're not a dead branch, but we're a branch who is trying to make themselves pleasing to God after salvation by doing and doing and doing. And so we have to understand that our part is just to bear the fruit that God is producing. That should be a sigh of relief. I'll take, I'm going to take one for you right now. Just think about that. There's always a list of things to do. Parents, be honest. Didn't you give your kids a bunch of things to do to make you happy? And we just come up with a whole new list? And then you go, I went to Bible school? And they had a list on top of lists. These guys are professional list makers. You might go to a legalistic church and say, well, all good Christians do this, and they wear this, and they don't do the other. And we have all this stuff, and I think that it's not at all what God is talking about. We are meant to abide in Christ. Turn to John chapter 15. One of my favorite passages of Scripture. But not a, can I be honest with you? I try to be an honest pastor. I don't know everything I need to know. I'm not the font of all knowledge. Can you believe it? I'm still learning stuff. This morning at the lake, God was telling me something a little different that I worked on all week. Please, Lord, a little earlier. Uh, th there's stuff that we don't understand. There's enough that we do, and we work on that. And please don't take that in a negative way. I'm just saying that, that God is still teaching it. Well, some of you guys have been Christians longer than I've been around. And are you still learning stuff? I'm not, no? <laughs> right? We're still learning stuff from the Lord. And so I want us to see that, that it's very important in John 15, and I wish I could do more, but I do want to do something here. Focus on the word bear. See how many times the word bear is mentioned and how many times produce is mentioned. This should be fun. John 15, 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Jesus is speaking, right? Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Oh, by the way, count the abides too. 
I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to me my disciples. Oh, it's so much fun being married to a pastor. This morning I got back from my walk, walkie-talkie with the Lord by Lake Doug uh, on the beach, and I came back. And we're about to come to church, and I said to my wife, In John chapter 15, do you think those guys are saved or unsaved? Thanks for that question. She's trying to eat her breakfast. And I said, what do you think? So we had a little theological discussion. Um, you know something? There's different, different opinions on that. But I want to focus on what we're supposed to do here. The command in John 15 is to abide in Christ. And abide means to, to dwell, to make your house there. To enjoy, listen, enjoy what you already have. Because it says here in my Bible, in verse to every branch in me. I'm already in him. That's positional. I need to enjoy my inness. I need to enjoy the fact that I'm in him. And the way I do that is by walking by the Spirit and abiding with Christ, increasing intimacy with him, delighting myself in him. And so if I'm delighting in Jesus and I'm walking by the Spirit, watch out, fruit gatherers. Because love and joy and peace and long suffering and lots of gentleness and goodness and faithfulness and meekness and all that self control will start to show up in my life. He produces, we bear. There is no command to bear fruit, there is no command to produce fruit, but there is a command to abide in Christ so that He does the work, He grows the fruit, He gets the glory. Does that make sense? So all that performance stuff, all that stuff that we felt we needed to do, look, I'm not saying we shouldn't be loving. I'm saying you can't be loving without His help. I'm not saying we shouldn't be joyful. I'm saying I can't be joyful without the Holy Spirit. Not the way I just described those parts. My job is to be saved in Christ and then to love it, delight in it, sit at His feet and spend time in His Word. And the more time I spend with Him, and the more time I spend with His Word, the more He, he changes me into His image. And it isn't something I did. It's something He did. I wasn't saved by Doug's doing. I can't be sanctified by Doug's doing. I can't make Him pleased. He was already pleased with me. It's the idea of living the life, experiencing in reality the things that are mine already. It's enjoying my earthlies on the way to my heavenly. And that's the Christian life. So when someone gives you a list of rules, you say, this is what you're supposed to do this week, right? Did you hear me say this? I want you to abide in Christ and walk in the Spirit. Can you, those two things. The rest of them, those happen when you do the first two. And so the whole idea of saying no to sin, you can't, but he can. Right? Loving that pesky neighbor, you can't, but he can. Being peaceful when the cancer is eating your body, you can't have peace, but He can. Let Him give it to you. Walk in the light of His peace. Walk in the fruit that comes from walking in the Spirit of God. Oh, rejoice in the plan of God for life this side of heaven. We're in Christ positionally, and the Holy Spirit is in us practically for practical living. He gave us everything we need. He gave us the, the, the Scripture. He gave us salvation, and then He parked His Holy Spirit right, smack, dab, inside of us. He moved in so that we can fulfill in His power, for His glory, the things that we need and He wants. So when we abide in the root, we can always bear the fruit. And the final glory goes to Him. What a beautiful, spiritual, fruit bowl. And we have that in us. If we're trusting in Christ, we have everything we need right now. Let's pray. Father God, help us today to recognize that we are able to be the person you want us to be, to do the things you want us to do, to think the thoughts you want us to think, to obey the commands you want us to obey, not because we're clever, not because we're more spiritual than those around us, not because we worked really, really hard at it, or this time we're really, really sincere this time. Oh, Father, you've forgiven us our sins. If we, if we confess them to you, we don't have to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I'm sorry with sugar on top. Cross my heart and hope not. That's, we're secure. We have salvation. You love us. You could never love us more. You could never love us less. 
So because we're secure in you, help us to move that to the next level. And instead say, I've sinned, I'm sorry, thank you for your forgiveness. Fill me with your spirit. May I walk again with Jesus. May I delight in you, O Holy One, O Beautiful One, Lover of my soul. And oh, the result in our lives, as the, as the shame and the guilt and the pressure and the, all those things wash away, and we are able to live a holy life because you are living through us. Oh, Father, that is, that's attractive to the world. People are going to want that stuff. And then we share the, our faith, and you work in their heart. That's how it works. Please help us to live in cooperation with you as we do this. In Jesus' name, amen.